Okay. So m functions and modules. <laughs> um, Python can be both procedural, that is, using functions, and object-oriented, and this is uh, using a concept called classes. We'll see lots of uh, object-oriented programming. Um, tomorrow we'll introduce you to object-oriented programming because we realize that's not uh, commonly taught in intro CS classes. Um, uh, but what we're going to talk about today mostly is functions, which in some sense is a uh, sort of um, more more base, right? You can use Python with uh, sort of an object-oriented uh, paradigm, but um, it's pretty hard not to use it in a procedural way. Um, okay, so what do functions look like? Well, they have this thing def in front of it, which is essentially the defining of that function. You have a function name, and then you have arguments, and there can be as many or as little arguments as you like. And then there's keywords. It's a little bit like our dictionary where we had a keyword value, keyword value, keyword value. And likewise, there can be an arbitrarily large number of these um, keyword values, and arbitrarily large number of these args. Um, when you have uh, an arg that's declared inside of the definition of this function, um, it is required. That is, if I say that I need x and y, if somebody calls this function and they only pass to me one variable or one number, uh, there'll be an error and um, you'll uh, have to deal with that. Uh, keywords are uh, considered optional. And when you say keyword uh, equals uh, value in the declaration of this function, you're more or less giving it a default. So that if you don't wind up um, giving a keyword of something when you're actually calling this function, uh, that default will be populated and then you can use it. Uh, as you'll end up seeing, it's actually a pretty nice way to extend functions that you know are already working. You can say, oh, I want to add a little more functionality to this function. I'm going to add a couple more keywords. And I'll set the defaults to be what they were as the legacy codes believe them to be. And now when I want to start using them um, in my new codes, I can make sure that I have access to those variables with inside of this function. So the good thing is you can name your function anything uh, you want, um, but it uh, can't start with a number. Um, it has to contain only numbers, letters, and underscores. So you can't have an exclamation point, for instance, in your uh, function, no matter how excited you are about it. Um, it is not the same as a, uh, uh, and it can't be the same name as a built-in function. That's not exactly true. You could actually rewrite a built-in function, but it'd be pretty silly to sort of rewrite something that you know is going to wind up being um, used by other built-ins. Again, when you start thinking about writing something beyond the sort of few lines of code, where you and others and people in your research group may be using it many times, you want to make sure that you're not doing anything um, that outside of the scope, as it's called, of your function. People might look at that and say, why are you rewriting built-in function? Just call it something else, right? My raising this thing to the power function would be better than calling it power. Um, there's uh, no difference um, with uh, functions and procedures. Um, in, say, IDL, if you're used to that, um, you declare a procedure, which is essentially a function, but it's not meant to return anything. A function um, in IDL and in Python returns something. And if you go through your function and you don't return anything, what's actually returned by your function for you is uh, none. So if I go through and I say, print um, I like money Python, and then I just return, um, you're actually uh, explicitly returning a none. Or you're implicitly doing it, but you now know it's explicitly happening. So either you return something, um, and you can return anything you want, um, or uh, you can just return and know that whatever is calling that uh, function will be getting a none back. So many times you might just say, go off and print something for me, that might be the name of your function, and it goes off and prints, and then it's returning back a none, but if you're not assigning the return value of that function to a variable inside of the thing that called that function, then you're fine, right? You didn't, you didn't use the none at all. Let's make a couple functions. This is your first uh, um, coding uh, with functions. We'll um, create a nice function called add nums. And uh, you see how we do this here, def add nums. And then we're going to have two, what are these things called? Arguments. So whatever I pass to add nums is going to get the first argument will be x, and the second one will be y, um, colon. And then you have to do indentation, because we're now inside of a block. 
And we'll do something really easy. We'll just return x plus y. OK? So what do you think happens when I say add nums to comma 3? Not that early anymore. So you get 5. What happens when I say add nums uh, ox? This is some octal thing. 3.3, uh, 34.3. So um, this is uh, essentially a representation of a number. And we now know from our first lecture that um, Python knows how to add um, two numbers together, even if they're intrinsically of different types. I'm sure this is working too well. Can everyone hear me OK? OK. Now, I want to add two numbers, but I'm going to be cheeky, and I'm going to call the first argument a string, which will be one character, a and b. What do you think happens here? A, b. Python says, oh, I know how to add strings together. But I call this add nums. I want these to be nums. I want these to be numbers, right? This is one of the negatives of the sort of um, weak uh, or dynamic typing in Python, is that just because I say, you know, add these two things together, doesn't mean I actually know what those things are. And there's different ways to deal with that. If you strictly want this thing only to be able to add numbers, um, you can uh, add what's called a decorator, which we won't even see in this boot camp. Or what you can do is inside of your function say, is x of type int or float or whatever? Is x, uh, is y of type int, float or whatever? And if it is, then do that. If not, do that. So you have to be sort of testing uh, in, um, in the case that you don't really want to get back a plus b is equal to ab. And what do you think happens here? I'm adding a string and an integer together. I get an error, okay? Because uh, what's happening inside of this function is exactly what would happen if I just said cat plus 23, I'd get an error. So unlike in C, we cannot declare what type of variables are required by the function. So you've got to be really careful in calling that function, but if you really want to be writing good code, you pretty much have to figure out a way within the function to ensure that uh, the variables that are passed to you, the arguments that are passed to you, are of the correct type. You know how to handle this. So let's make this a little nicer. Um, if not an instance of float, int, or long, and y is not an instance of float, int, or long, say I cannot add these types. And so I'm going to say string of this type and string of this type. So I'm going to, I'm going to figure out what the type is of x, figure out what the type is of y, and I'll return. What am I returning when I return? None. Even though I didn't say return none, I could also say return none. Otherwise, so I'm in this, I'm in the outer block here, return x plus y. Print add nums to comma 3.0, 5. Add nums 1a, I don't get an error anymore. I say I cannot add these types together. And you see I printed out none. Any questions about that? Um, you would need a return statement just in the way that I constructed this. Uh, th by the way, you see how it's not indented? This, this I is to the left of the D. That's because of all these extra carrots. If you typed in def add nums, and then you, then you basically will wind up uh, pressing a tab or a couple of spaces to start your block here. But um, that's, so that's just how that winds up looking on, on the screen. Um, sorry, the, the question was about this return. You pretty much need it um, because of the way that I constructed it. You could say, uh, you know, z equals five, and then here you could wind up saying if z is not equal to five, then return x plus y, and then you could just not say anything else, and then there's an implicit return, and it'll also return none. But it's pretty clear here. If I'm inside here, I don't want to be doing what what this person thinks they're doing. Yeah. Just to be sure, we cannot have complex numbers here, right? Yes, I did not check all of the errors. Well, if I added two complex numbers together, that would also that would work because complex numbers know how to be added together. If you added an int and a complex number, that would also work. If I had a string and a complex number, that would not work. And what I think you're guessing at is that I haven't checked all cases here. Yeah, the so complex numbers in this in this particular function would they work? They would work. They should work. 
What's that? The complex number is what type is it? A complex is its own it's its own type. It's a complex type. Oh, oh, so how would it work with this error checking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he would say, no, I don't know how to do complex addition, even though we know that Python knows how to do complex addition. Yeah, I should, to make this even even uh, <laughs> sort of more robust, add the, the complex. Good. Any other questions? Let's talk a bit about scope. Um, where these uh, variables that we assign have meaning, and who has access to those that, that, that variable. So add nums, if I just type add nums at the command line, and you, you should do this as well, I wind up seeing this interesting thing. Um, essentially a string representation of what add nums is. Add nums is a function. If you type type add nums, you would get, it would say that it's a function, right? I think it would say a user build function. Here it's actually telling us where the memory address is that starts off where this function actually lives. You don't generally have to care about that. It's useful if you need to see whether two functions are actually the same thing. Because you could have two variables pointing to the same function that lives in memory, and they could essentially be identical even though they have different names. Type add num function. Yes? So I'm getting, when instead of getting function add num, that's the location, I'm getting function underscore main underscore block add So that might be how it looks in IPython. IPython may be wrapping around it. If you do this within Python, you should see something more like that. x equals 2. Again, most of these things that you would do here are when you're working at the interpreter level. When you're actually building a script that would run, um, Python, IPython will basically be implementing that script in exactly the same way. Um, x equals 2, print add nums 5, 6, 11, print x, 2. What happened here? <laughs> That's right. So this is a first example of uh, scope. This variable x only has meaning in my current, as it's called, namespace, as I'm running this from um, the interpreter. But x has a different meaning inside of that function. So I can do whatever I want to inside of that function, and I'm not going to wind up interacting with um, what I call x in my sort of main function. So Python has its own local variables list. And x is not modified globally. It'd be sort of bad practice if you only had three variable names in every function you kept reusing those things, right? This is in general bad practice, coding-wise, to have names that are not descriptive for variables, right? You'd probably want to call this the first variable that I'm going to wind up adding with another variable. And the second one, which we're calling y, call it the second variable, which I'm going to add with another variable. And that's pretty descriptive. So that people then know, and that's actually kind of one way in which people who are writing lots of Python code can, can sort of deal with the fact that they don't know explicitly what the type is supposed to be of that variable. They will say variable x is an int, and that will be the variable name. So that you know that when it's being used throughout the rest of the code, that it should be of type int. Doesn't mean that Python will enforce that, it just means when you're reading it, you have a descriptive word or, or sets of words um, for, uh, for that. Um, for that variable. Okay, we're going to create another function called numop. And what is it going to do? It's going to take the first argument and multiply it by 3.14, which is the value for pi in Kansas. Actually, it's 3 in Kansas. <laughs> Did you know that? Look it up. The legislature tried to pass a law saying that, that pi was going to be equal to 3. Um, <laughs> so uh, it might not be Kansas, it's one of those. Um, so we're going to return x plus y. Thankfully, not being taped. Um, so, uh, what's that going to be if I give it x is equal to 1? And I'll say, well, this is 1 here, so x uh, 3.14 plus y, so sh I should get 6.14. Okay? So, I declared a variable x here, and then I reuse it here, and it's going to have a different value of x here, but in my own namespace, it's still, it's still 1. Everyone okay with that? <coughs> there is a way to actually have x be part of sort of what's called the global namespace, and that's when you declare it as a global variable. It's not common at all to see global variables used in good Python code, but it is possible to use it. 
3.14. So I'm essentially redeclaring. And by the way, you can see that I can just re-co-op this function name and reuse it. If I declare it again and define it again, then it's going to have um, you know basically new meaning. In this case, I'm defining it almost the same way. I'll have this thing called global A, which says that A is a global variable. And you notice, even though I didn't define what A is, this is a little bit dangerous inside of my function, I'm assuming that A has been defined somewhere else. And I'm going to add 1 to that, and then I'm going to return a tuple, which will be x plus y, and then comma A. So it'll be a two-element tuple that I'm returning. So now we set A equal to 1, I'm off 1, 1, and what do I get out of that? Okay, so let's check this out. So a is equal to 1, x is equal to 1, y is equal to 1, 3.14, and I'm going to add 1 to a, and then I'm going to return a, so now it's 2, and now I've got uh, what I had before, uh, 3.14, and I'm adding y is now 1, so I should get back 4.14. What if I run it again? Three. So I actually had access to this value of A, and the value of A in my global namespace, in my actual main function, if I printed that out, would be three. Sorry, it would be two when I come out of this first time, but inside of this, I'm changing it and making it three. And now it's the, its value is equal to three. Because Python has a, uh, some difficulty in storing um, more than 16 bit. I mean, the native Python, when you're st storing something as a float, stores it as 16 bit. And when you're not doing um, a, an explicit print on it, I'm essentially printing a tuple, which is just doing whatever it can to print what's inside of that tuple. It prints the sort of ugly version of that. Um, if I just printed out the first element of that, I would get back 4.14, uh, you know, as printed out to me in the standard out. But this is how the best that Python knows how to represent 4.14 in memory. Okay, so we can return whatever we want. We've just been returning, here we've returned a tuple, or we can return a dictionary, list of strings, et cetera, et cetera. We can return whatever we want. You'll see the power of this as time goes on. Yes? So the way to get a global variable into a function is just to have a line that says global in the name of the variable, and then the function starts paying attention to that. Yeah, that, I did the minimal thing you need to do, but what you could also do is declare it to be global in the main namespace, and and then just declare it global wherever you go. You're not hurting yourself by saying, in this function, it's also considered global. Yeah? Is there a way like, you can speak of send pointer? Like, point to a certain variable that's outside the function? Pointer. Yeah. What is this pointer you speak of? <laughs> yes. Well, okay. So I knew this was going to come up. So what you're actually doing when you say, you know, x is equal to some list, is your x is now effectively a pointer to some object in memory that knows that it is of type list and knows all of the methods and stuff on top of it. So when you are passing a variable, in this case, you know, passing x, where x is a list, to a function, you're not actually making a copy of that list and passing it to the function. You're passing a reference to that list. You're already doing pointers. I just tried not to tell you that. We'll see like, how this gets really confusing when you've got super complex um, variable types or classes or instances of classes, and those themselves have attributes of lists and things. Those are basically also pointers to different places in memory. Um, it, it'll start helping to know about the concept of pointers, but for now, it's not that important. Other to say that when I, when I actually call a function with some complex variable, I'm not actually passing off um, the uh, I'm not actually passing off a um, new version of it. In the case of strings and ints and floats, you actually are um, doing that. But in the case of lists and other mutable objects, you're passing a reference to that object. There's a question back there. I just want to clarify that if you pass a list and you change it in the function, it will change if you come back to the global scope. Yes. Okay. We'll, get it. we'll see more of that later on. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, or yeah, so we'll see, we'll see exactly that over the next several slides. But the answer is yes. Any other questions? OK, let's do a um, little bit more about just um, creating functions. And so far, I've only showed you arguments. Um, but we're going to now look at keywords. So here, I've got two keywords. I have my two arguments, x and y. I've got two, uh, two uh, keywords, optional, um, optional uh, um, arguments, essentially, to uh, this function. Multiplier is 1.0. Greeting is thank you for your inquiry. Let's see how we're going to use that. If greetings is not none, so basically, if I said greetings equal none, so if it's got something, just print the greeting. Uh, and return x plus y times the multiplier. You notice I've done no error checking here, right? It's probably OK to print greetings, whatever it is. But the multiplier, what if multiplier was spam? That wouldn't make sense at all, right? Um, so we have to be a little bit careful here. I haven't really done any good error checking. But this is really just to illustrate the concept of keywords. So if I say numop1, comma 1, well, what's the default? The default is multiplier is 1, and greeting is thank you for your inquiry, thank you for your inquiry 2.0. It just use the defaults, right? But now if I want to get a little fancy and I want to have my multiplier be minus 0.5, I'm going to multiply minus 0.5 times 1 plus 1, and so I'm going to get something like minus 1. I'll set the greeting to none, and I just get minus 1. I've got no greeting. Yes? Yes? Uh, why is it returning a float? Because I've given it two integers. Anyone help me out? Yeah, it's a multiplier. The multiplier is itself 1.0. If the multiplier was 1, then it would be multiplying by uh, another int, and I'd get back an int. Unless one of the two arguments was a float. Yeah? You have to say multiplier equals negative 0.5, and you just say, like, the third case is automatically So, yeah, that's a good question. You could give, you, you could remove the multiplier equals and you could remove the greetings and then Python would say, okay, I know the order in which you want to do this, but uh, it's pretty bad coding practice to do that. If it's a keyword, you should say the keyword equals this. Because it may be that you've got 30 keywords and you only want to change some of them. And it may be that for whatever reason, you want to make sure that as you're reading the code that the most volatile keyword is the one that people are reading when they first see it. So you can put the keywords in any order you want. I guess that's something to, to make note of. So I could only give a greetings keyword, or I could only give a multiplier keyword. I could give greetings before the multiplier, and that would be valid. Yes? Can you uh, specify keywords um, um, The question is, can you do it? Uh, shortened to uniqueness. I believe you cannot. Um, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. Paul? Uh, if we just said uh, m equals 0.5, would this function say, I think this function would say, I don't know what m is, right? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have yeah. I think if that is. If you just said 0.5, though, it would yeah. be. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So the, the way to think about these are that, you know, in some sense, this is sort of like a dictionary. I've got key, value, key, value. And the way to think about these when I actually define the function is that this is sort of the default value for those keys. So I can use multiplier and greetings throughout the rest of my function as if I had defined them outside of that function. Or this is what I think the standard everyone's really going to want to use. right? So you think of this in terms of how other people are going to want to be using your code or what the default is. And it's only when you want to change things to see default, you know, how the default behaviors um, get changed would you do that. Yeah? Uh, I did hear the answer. I hear somebody ask, oh, you find out very clearly, change thank you to thanks? Is that? Oh, where did I do that? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, that was, that's, that's a typo. I must have had two versions of this. Python is not that smart. <laughs> very good catch. <laughs> wow, amazing. We've probably done well. We've done this boot camp twice before. I think it's always been there. No one's ever said. So you're awake, and you get you get a special sticker at the end. Yeah, too. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm sure you left way before it was crazy. Um, all right, so there's some special kinds of arguments um, and uh, keywords in defining the function. If you have a star and then some word, it doesn't have to be arguments, but it's nice to say arguments, and a double star and then something else, this is kind of a special way to say, I have no idea how many arguments you're going to give me, and I have no idea how many keywords, but I'll accept it, I'll chomp it up, and I know now how to iterate over those. Because keywords is going to be a dictionary, and arguments is going to wind up being a list. However many arguments I wind up sending. So here's Cheese Shop, which harkens back to the, uh, the, the little uh, movie we saw at the beginning here. Do you have any kind? So that's, that's an argument, so that has to be there. So when I pass this, it's got to be it's got to be there. Question mark. I'm sorry, we're all out of kind. Four arguments in uh, four arg in arguments print arg. So I'm now going to loop through all of those, and I'm going to print those, and then I'm going to have a little break here, and I'm going to say keys equals uh, keywords dot keys. So you can see why this is a dictionary. Keys dot sort, and then I'm going to wind up printing out. Um, uh, all of the keywords and then um, all of the values associated with those keywords. So let's let's try to make this um, let's try to make this sketch that we just saw. Here's uh, Limburger. So this is the kind that's going to get assigned to kind. It's very runny, sir. It's really very very runny, sir. And then we're going to say shopkeeper equals Michael Palin, client equals John Cleese, sketch equals Cheese Shop. Can we get this? Um, no, you notice that the for loops I just did on one line. Oh, okay. If there were multiple uh, multiple things to evaluate, you would do it on multiple lines. Um, it's actually pretty good coding practice to have it on separate lines. I just did this just for making it compact on the screen, and it's it's not actually illegal. Are there other types you can use? Like, if you want three different things, for example, like arguments. No, this is about as much as you could do. You can name a couple other keywords that you want to capture explicitly. So if I said um, director equals whoever, and I gave director uh, here, I'd say director equals, then I would capture that and I'd throw that explicitly into the director key. Um, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a dictionary. It would be outside of this keywords dictionary. So this is nice because you can just capture things you know you want. And then you can capture all the stuff you don't really care about. And maybe you want to pass all the stuff that you don't really care about over to some other sub-function that does care about those arguments or keywords. But now I don't have to actually explicitly capture each one of those. What if there's something else like you don't know how many there are? Like how many arguments on the things that you didn't know? So like that's, that's what this thing does. Right, so if there's one more set you want to do, like other than arguments and keywords. If you want to do something else, do one more set of variables. No, this is it. This is really it. I can name any arguments I want, and all the everything that starts at the beginning. So if I named, let's say, kind and um, what do you say as, as two different arguments, Limburger would be kind, and what what did you just say is would be this. And then instead of it having uh, getting chomped up into this arguments list, it would the first thing would wind up making its way into this name variable, and the second thing would make its way into the list. And that list would be of length two and not of length one. So either you name it, or you have to just say this and this, right? There's really only two kinds of things you can send to uh, a function. It's arguments or keywords. Everyone clear on what's happening here? Yeah. Thank you, going back. An argument is, is distinguished by just having the value and the keyword is distinguished by having the whatever it is equal thing. Okay. Um, we haven't been very good about documenting our code because um, we're just trying to introduce concepts, but it's time to start thinking about documentation. And Python makes it really simple for you to document your code, and there is now no excuse not to. Um, Okay, so what does that mean? So it's the right thing to do. It makes it simple. There is this concept of what's called the doc string. The doc string is the first unassigned string in a function, class, method, program, or whatever. If I'm, look, if I'm looking inside of a function and it says def this, and then I go on down and I see this string that isn't assigned to anything, that's what's called the doc string. In this case, because we're going to write a nice descriptive statement about what this thing actually does, 
I'm just going to create a double, a, a triple quote here. And this should be indented, by the way, because it's inside of this def. I don't know why it didn't come out that way. Um, uh, numop, this does a simple operation. Two numbers, we expect x and y are numbers and return blah, blah, blah. Multiplier is also a number. It defaults to one. You can specify a small greeting as a string. So then we'll just do this thing that we had before. So that's numop one. Um, and I think it's in the tarball that I gave you. Yes? Does it does It does not. I usually use three double quotes just to also remind myself I'm doing something sort of special here. But if it was a single quote um, or, uh, or basically a single double quote, if it's unassigned. So if I said A equals this, that would not be considered adoption. But, but are three single quotes also adoption? Three single quotes would also be fine for adoption. Um, so if you do this, um, and you make a little doc string in a function, and by, by the way, I think I have this in a Python file called num, uh, numop1.py, and it's in the tarball that you can get from the website. Um, you'll wind up seeing, um, after we, I'll show you how to import that, we'll wind up seeing how to uh, interface with it. So if I just type um, help numop1, after I've declared it, I wind up seeing this really nice doc string. So now when you type help something, you say, OK, what is, uh, what is pow? What is str? What is anything that's built in? If you just say help and then parentheses around it, you'll wind up getting its doc string. It automatically So, yeah, yeah, so, it, so if we go back and we look at what that function actually is, you just declare it like normal, and you can have a doc string or you don't have to have a doc string. Um, when it goes through and you do that help, it goes through the actual code and it says, where is the first, you know, double quote or triple quote, and what's unassigned, okay, that's the doc string. You can put whatever you want in there. Oh, no, no, no. So I might have written, I, again, this might have been like I had two versions of this. No, OK, this is it's another good catch. It didn't figure that out. Mm -hmm. I actually wrote a be better version of the doc string before I made the next slide. I'm sorry about that. Good catch. Yes, OK, very good catch. Thank you. Um, what's really nice is that you can create a um, sort of web, uh, nice web-looking version of that doc string. And you can do this from the command line. Since you all have the um, nthought distribution, this should just work if you type pydoc minus w numop uh, one. And by the way, the name of the file is numop one dot py in your in the directory in that tarball that I gave you. Um, try to give that a shot. And what you should see is that it will write a file called uh, numop1.html. And if, you, if you're in a Mac, you can just say open numop1.html. Um, or if you're not on a Mac, you can go into a browser and um, basically open up that file directly. And you should see something that looks like this. So numop1, um, this is the doc string for the entire file. We'll take a look at that in a second. Um, and there are functions within uh, that file. And here you see it's sort of nicely formatted what the input and outputs are. And here's my doc string. Oops. 
So here's that file, um, just the top part of it. You see I had a doc string up here, and then I had a doc string inside of the function. And that's it. Any questions about that? What are these scripts um, called? Well, the way we think about these scripts, something.py, is we think of them as something called modules. These are organized units written as files which contain functions, statements, and other definitions. Um, many of you may be used to essentially writing a big code base, which is essentially all just one file. Um, that's not wrong, but um, usually what you should be able to do is take a look at what's in that code and break that up into different logical pieces. Typically, what you would think about is within this sort of piece of code, something.py, this uh, exposes a whole lot of functionality that I want and perhaps want to use somewhere else. Um, now, that's all really just up to you to decide how to do that. You can make one really long file, or for every function you write, you could actually have a different file. It's up to you to decide how to do that. Any file ending in .py is treated as a module, so numop1.py, which names and defines a function. numop1 is an example of a module. Um, modules own global uh, names and functions so that you can do anything you want inside of there and not conflict with other modules. So if I want to say x equals 5 inside of numop1, then some other code could be saying x equals 12, and if the two things are calling each other, as long as they're not explicitly passing uh, the value of x back and forth, they have sort of that local sense of, um, of control of, over that namespace. Yes? Is that true even if you say global x at the top of the um, I believe if you said global x within a module, so within a file, and then in another file you imported it, that module, we'll show what that means to import, and then you said global within this other file, I believe they wouldn't actually cross over. I believe global winds up remaining at least contained within that module. It's very uncommon to use globals, and so uh, there's, a, there's a chance I'm wrong about that. Yeah? The modules have to be single files. No. We'll see more about that as well. The question is, do modules have to be single files? No, you can actually create a directory, which is the module name. And you can have a special file inside of that directory, which is called underscore underscore init underscore underscore dot py. And something which imports, uh, which is, thinks it's importing a module, is it can effectively look inside of the directory and do whatever uh, that init file says you should do. So if there's other files inside of that, you can actually import all those other files inside of the init file and expose that into the namespace. We'll see a little bit more of kind of the carpentry of how to do that later. So there is another function that you have, um, uh, another module that has a function inside of it. This is called numfun1. And it also defines a function called uh, numop1. It's very similar to the one that we had before. Now to get access to this within our namespace, we just say import numfun1. We don't say import numfun1.py. We say import numfun. Give that a try, if you would. Now, when I want to use functions that are defined within that module, I have to access those functions. And to do that is I have to start off with the name of that module, dot, a function that got created within that module, and then I can do whatever I want with that. I did, you can do this within IPython, you can do it within uh, IPython Notebook or, or, or IPython itself, all that should work. Does it work in somebody? What happens if I say numop1? Numop1 is not defined in my namespace. I have to go into what's called the namespace or the scope of uh, this module, numfun1. Right? 
So I can't get access to things that are inside of this module unless I explicitly ask for it. And this dot thing here allows us to go into this module numfun1 and get access to how it defines this thing called uh, numop1. Let's um, play a little bit with scope because it's important to understand how this works. There's another file in that directory called numfun2. Um, and here's my little tiny doc string up here, small demo of modules. I've got a little doc string over here as well. Um, and it's basically doing the stuff we had done before. And I'm going to say numfun2 is in the house. That's a print statement. And it happens at the top level of this module. x is equal to 2, s is equal to spam with two n's. Import numfun2, what do you think is going to happen? This script is going to execute, and Python's going to go, what should I do? Doc string, blah, print. Oh, I'm going to print numfun2 is in the house. I'm going to set equal, x equal to 2, s equal to span, I'm going to create this new function. numfun2 in the house. What if I say import numfun2 again? Well, if Python already knows about something in its namespace and you say import again, it's going to say, no, 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 don't worry, I already know about this. And it won't print it again. It won't actually execute it. Yes? So if I'm basically saying it is on numfun1, and then we import it back I'll show you how to do that. <coughs> print numfun2.x, numfun2.s. These are effectively variables that are associated with this module numfun2 that live in the namespace of numfun2. Well, we set those up there, x equals 2, s equals spam, right? Now, let me just say right here in the interpreter, s equals eggs, print s, and then we print uh, numop2.s, eggs and spam. Right? Because s is a variable that makes sense in my current namespace, but I haven't actually dug into numop2 namespace yet. But now let me do that. numop2s, its value I'm going to essentially overwrite with the value I think s should be in my own namespace, and I'll print those guys out again, and they're the same. Is everyone okay with that? Okay, so I'll quit out of that. Um, so that's a little bit cumbersome, like I want to use some function inside of some module. What if it's a function that I want to use all the time, and I want to have to say module name dot the name of that function? Well, you can explicitly bring it into your current namespace, and the way you do that is you say from module name import function name. From module name import variable, so I could just say import uh, the variable s. Now s is in my current namespace. From module name, import variable, function name, function name, blah, 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 right? So from module, from numfun2, import x and numop1. All right, so good. I've got my, uh, this is my function. I've got x. I just executed for the first time. You notice in the previous slide, I quit out of Python, and now I've gotten back into Python, just so I don't pollute namespaces. Is x equal to 2? Yes, because I actually explicitly pulled the x as it was declared in this module numfun2. I pulled it into my namespace, so now it has meaning in my own current namespace. I can run numop1, get my 5. Remember, s is declared inside of, um, inside of numfun2. Yes? Is it okay only if importing x and numop1 still runs the whole module? Yes, that's a good question. So the question was, even if we, or common, even if we are only importing parts of what's inside of that uh, module, is Python actually importing and running through the whole script? The answer is yes. So if I had said at the very bottom, uh, so at the top I said x equals 2 and x equals 50 at the end, by the time it finishes executing all of it, it would say x equals 50. Yeah? Can we change variables within the module? Change in the actual module, right? Like the thing you did before with numfun2.s would change it. The actual numfun2 would change it. The file would change it. 
the file itself doesn't change. What you've done is you've written you've written Python, and the interpreter has basically um, you know turned it into something it knows how to execute uh, in essentially real time, and that's just living in memory. So it has a view of what NumFun2 should look like or NumOp2 should look like, and if you are playing around with that view, but you're essentially messing around with uh, the variables, um, it's not actually changing it on disk, right? It's not changing it in the file itself. You'd have to actually go in, edit that file, and rewrite it. Um, so what's S here? So what am I guess? Is S part of my namespace yet? No, I haven't explicitly said, give me everything inside of NumFun2. I don't know what S is. <coughs> NumFun2.x? I don't know what NumFun2 is. How come I don't know what NumFun2 is? Right, I did a from. I did not import NumFun2. I went into NumFun2 and I imported just the things that I wanted. But if, if you define a bunch of stuff in there, does it just get rid of all that? You know? Yep. Okay. Yep. So if I define, so it's a good question. So we actually define in the execution of the script what S was. S got created in memory. The script sort of finished the you know, Python looking through that script, and now S is like off in the ether. And in fact, what actually happens is all the references to the value of what S is pointing to are, are not actually being used anywhere. And so um, Python will do garbage collecting of the memory and essentially deletes S. But if you looked at the memory profile, you'd build up all the variables that were inside of that script, and then you'd tear everything back down by the time you got out of it. Yes? NumUp1 is the function that we define inside of the module NumFun2. Let's say we've got uh, a function inside there which is called you know, SpongeBob SquarePants, and we want to rename it to something like take the square root of something. Right? Um, let's say I don't like the name as it is named within that function. I can rename it whatever I want. And effectively, what I'm doing is I'm creating a new variable, which is a pointer to the uh, to that function. And it has some other name, it has some memory location, but I want to use it however I want. So from NumFun, uh, NumFun2, import S as my favorite food. From NumFun2, import NumOp1 as wicked awesome adder, because I didn't like the name. I can print my favorite food, I get spam, wicked awesome adder, I get the value I expect. Yeah? So if you're doing the uh, multiple different lines and going to the same module, is it executing the whole module file each time? No. So when I say import um, module name, let's just start off with that. It's effectively going into that file, executing everything. And you know, if there's something like print or set x, x equal to this, it's just doing it in, in memory, right? And then if I'm creating a function, I'm creating a function which will wind up living in memory, and then it's done. So if I keep on saying import, 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 it's like, no, 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 I know about that already, I know about that already, I know about that. As soon as you say, I don't know about that, it will then go back and it will try to, it'll actually have to reread that script to import it. But, but, but you, you said, you know, it gets to the end, it garbage collects, throws away everything that it's not referencing right yeah. now. And yet, you're only referencing the first one, S, my favorite food, and so isn't it presumably throwing everything else away and then it's got to reread the whole file again yeah. to get them up? Yeah. So it does, it does load it again? That again. Yeah. Yeah. So another way to deal with this is I know I like everything within this awesome module. Let's just say import everything into my namespace. This is considered bad coding practice. But when you're trying to prototype something, you're trying to get something going quickly, and you know everything inside, like the math function, the math module has lots of great stuff, like square root, and that's not a built-in function, actually square root. But many things are not built-ins. Let's say I want to have pi in my namespace, and I know I'm going to use it all the time, and I want to have to say math.pi. I can just say from math import star. Now I've got everything that math knows how to do. That's fine, except if you're writing a code about cooking, and you 
forget the letter E, and now you've got tau equals some function, then you know you've polluted your namespace with a number, you polluted it, and now it's conflicting with some other um, uh, some other function you created in your namespace. So a way to avoid name conflicts is by not doing that. When you type IPython, I believe it's doing from numpy, which is sort of the numerical stuff within Python that does arrays, import star. So you, and then from, if you say IPython minus minus PyLab on the command line, it's importing all the stuff you need to do plotting. So instead of having to do all the import blah 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 from matplotlib, now you just say plot and then you've got a plot. So IPython is sort of saying, look, we know why people actually use Python. They're using it usually for numerical stuff and usually for you know plotting stuff. We're just going to do all this stuff for you. And you can set, obviously, all the default behaviors of what IPython does when it starts up. Is there a question? Yeah. Can you put the absolute or path No, you can't do absolute path names here. So you can't do you know, C colon slash blah, 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 or slash application slash blah, blah, blah. You have to. Um, uh, for those that are uh, sort of comfortable with environment variables, you have to set something called Python path. And it's all capitals, Python path. And that's telling the Python interpreter when it starts, where are the places it's allowed to look for modules as you say import something. And so you can change Python path actually on the fly within Python if you really want to. Um, typically what you'll do is, you know, you have a couple places where your Python modules live. You'll set uh, Python path essentially pointing to all of those different places. You're careful about the order in which those appear. And it says, if you say import, you know, import something interesting, it'll go and it'll look in each of those directories and say, is that there? If not, I don't know what that module is. You can do, I believe, a path above your current path, and you can do a dot dot, but it's pretty uncommon. Yeah? Yeah, and I think the default is you get Python path, but then it also explicitly looks in the current directory where you're executing your interpreter. And so if you just have all of those modules where you are, you'll get all that stuff. And I believe it does that first. So it'll look to see if you've written a module called pow, and you say import pow, it will, it will look at that first before it looks at other directories. But yes, typically if you're building up a big code, you would more or less say, you know, Python path, equals all the normal stuff, and then colon, you know, pointer to the directory of where my other code is. So now I can just say, I'm up one, there it is. So it's convenient, but it's considered bad coding style, it pollutes your namespace, um, be careful if you use it. So there is a way to do that in Python easily. That's with the parentheses whose, uh, W-H-O-S. Um, but I, we don't remember the way to do it just in native Python interpreter. There is a way to get access to that. And does the runtime change by importing stuff in different ways? How so? What do you mean by change? Uh, if you use either import star, or if you just import the functions that you need, it does the overall run slower, or does not make a difference? Um, that's a good question. I I believe if you've got functions, Paul, what do you think about that? I'm sorry. Paul was doing his email. Um, so if you import star, or let's say I just import some of the modules from uh, some of the functions within star, is it about the same amount of time to do one or the other if I really only need uh, you know those few functions? I think the answers are about the same, right? Yeah, it still has to go through the entire file. So when you, if you have a function defined twice in the file, it'll it'll uh, grab the last version of that. So it's not like once it finds the function, it knows it can stop. And just keep going through. What's that? Okay, so um, we've just created our own modules, but you know there are the built-in functions that you've already seen, like pow and str and you know, a bunch of different things we've already used here, uh, or raw underscore input. Those are built-in functions. 
But if you want to get access to sort of the next level of capability outside of the, uh, the, the built-in library, you're going to want to use other modules. And Python comes with lots and lots of modules. One is called Sys, which exposes interpreter stuff um, like file I.O. and environmental things. OS, which um, sort of uh, gives platform-specific OS functions like um, how old is this file, when was it last changed. It gives you directory services, like um, if I want to list out a directory, you would do that. Math, as I said before, has things like math.py, uh, has, uh, has other functions. Um, they're pretty battle tested. They're about as fast as you're going to get. Sometimes they change a tiny bit, but, but OS system and math are like essentially as good as being built in. Um, they, come, uh, they come with the, uh, with the Python distributions. And so all of these, every line of code has been heavily scrutinized, and it's about as fast as you can imagine. Um, so if I want to know something about uh, sys and what that sort of exposes to me, I can say um, import sys, uh, help sys. Let's try that. So I can see all the things that sys knows how to do. The other Python way of doing that, IPython way, is sys.tab. So I can see all the things that I can do within, uh, within sys. I don't know what the get trace is. I can ask a question of that. I can look at its doc string. Oh, it returns a global debug tracing function. And that is sys.version. That's kind of useful to have. It's a string representation of the Python that I'm using. Um, anyway, so you'll wind up sort of exploring all these different capabilities um, over the coming days. I want to just show you some of the ones that we uh, think you'll probably wind up using a lot. There's another file in your tarball called getinfo.py. You notice I'll say import OS, import sys. I haven't said what I want from in there, but I basically said just go in, um, get it all in a memory. I'll tell you what I want later on. Get info, so I'll give it an optional, what is this thing called, this path? Keyword. And what's the default? Dot, right? That's the Unix way of saying the current directory. I've made a nice little doc string. You are using Python version, comma, so that's saying don't actually, uh, don't actually add um, unnaturally a new line. Sys.version, we just saw what that was. Um, add a little break here. Files in the directory. So OSPath.abspath. You notice here that abspath is basically a, um, a, a function that lives within a sub-module of the module OS. And you just had to know that to get an absolute path, this is how you get it. Right? This is one of the problems with Python is it's not like you just express yourself, I'd love to have something that gives me the absolute path of what dot is, and it just appears. Effectively, you can ask Google that exact question, and you'll probably get that back. But this is one of the problems, uh, in some sense, with the rich syntax of Python, is knowing kind of where to get at uh, the types of functionality that you think that you need. But anyway, path, and you give it the path. For x, uh, sorry, for f, um, in OS Lister, that's a new uh, function that we haven't told you about yet. Of the path print f. What do you think this is doing? What do you think Lister does? It lists all the files in the directory. OS Lister returns a, a dictionary of all the file names in the special in the specified directory. Um, I'm not sure if it's dictionary. Yeah, maybe it's dictionary. Sys uh, dot version string represent, representation of the of Python. I don't think you need these things here. I don't think it's actually a function. I think it's just a variable. Um, so check that out. Make sure I'm not wrong about that. But I think I should get rid of that. OS path, abs path, translation of a given path name to an absolute path. Um, we can try that out if you want. But one of the things I wanted to say is that uh, there are dozens and dozens of these built-in modules. And you'll say, I really want to be able to email somebody. I wonder if there's an email module. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like, predates that, yeah, there's an app for that. There is essentially a module for everything that you want to do. Almost, I mean, not doing like hardcore science or whatever, but to do something, to do some part of the workflow that you have a guess that probably somebody else in the world has had to do at some point, 
there is very likely a Python module that does that. So don't just go off and like start writing things like how to send emails, because there's like 12 different ways to do that. Okay? That's a little warning. Some of you have seen this XKCD article. Uh, maybe you now understand it a little bit. How are you flying? And this guy says, Python. I learned it last night. Everything's so simple. Hello world is just print hello world. I don't know, dynamic typing, white space, really? Come join us. Programming is fun again. A whole new world up here. But how are you flying? I just typed import anti-gravity. That's it? I also sampled everything in the medicine cabinet for comparison. Um, but I think it's a Python. Uh, this is funny, but it's actually pretty true. Um, it is a little crazy, and people who don't like Python will say, there's a module for everything, because it means that you really have to know what's out there. Um, but you know, import email, right? Or import web browser. I mean, there's just stuff that you'd want to do is very accessible to you now in Python. And things that aren't in the sort of um, Python package itself likely comes in third-party packages. And you'll just see more and more of that as time goes on. OK, so how do we make our script um, executable? Uh, when a script module is run from the command line, a special variable called underscore underscore name underscore underscore is set to main. So what you will typically see at the very bottom of many um, uh, .py files is what looks a sort of like a C main function where you say if name is equal to equal to main, this will only get executed inside if I'm run from the command line. So if I import a module from some other module or from the command line, um, inside of the namespace of that module, its value of underscore underscore name is not that, it's something else, it's actually the name of the module. If I import it directly from the top level interpreter, or as I execute it as a script, it, that name will have that variable uh, of string, right? And so that part will get executed. This is how you effectively say, if I'm running this thing from the command line, run all this stuff inside. If not, just basically expose all the things that this function knows how to do. So to make it truly executable, on the first line, you'll typically do a um, hash uh, sign, an exclamation point, and slash user slash bin slash env python, which just runs this, uh, which runs this executable called env, which says, where is python? Sometimes you'll just have bin env, and you have to make sure that it works on your architecture. Yes? So a hash with an exclamation mark is no longer a comment. Yes, it's a special thing, and, it, and I believe it only is allowed to be on the first line. There may be, you may be allowed to have special encoding statements on the first line, but typically this is the first line you see which says, hey, this module is actually callable from the command line. It has some real functionality. Right? If the module is called email everybody in my group, and you know, um, basically it's got, a, it's got a name underscore main, and it sets the whole list of all the people in your group and their current emails, and then above that is some function which says email a list. And you pass that, that's what it does. But email a list could be useful in other, in other, in other sort of domains as well. Yeah? Um, so this is a dot .py, right? Not yes. Not dot th, or this is a dot .py. No, this is a .py file. You can call it, I mean, you can call it anything you want, but you're being pretty mean if you say dot .ch at the end of it, or sh at the end, and it's actually Python. It's just a Python script. Yeah, I was about that too. So what's the confusing part? What is the point of the script, I guess? You're talking about functions, you're talking about modules, and now all of a sudden we're talking about scripts. And so I guess I lost the flow. Ah, OK, good. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you're asking me about that. When we're writing um, functionality, in the form of functions within modules. You're generally writing Python code, right? You're writing something.py. And the way we've been thinking about it until now, where I say import you know, numop. whatever, um, and you start running uh, some of the functionality from within that module, um, that's fine. But what are you actually writing Python for? It's not just to play around on the command line. It's to do something. It's like make a plot, right? Or email your, email your group, or do something, right? When you think about doing something, you're talking about executing something. And instead of you sitting at the command line and saying, import something, 
effectively what you're doing is you're turning what was a module that needed to be imported by other modules or by you by hand into something which is itself executable. So all you're basically saying is that if you run this module, so if I said Python module named up py, you're saying start up a Python interpreter and run everything that's inside the script and do whatever it tells you to do. Or I can avoid having this, have that word Python in front of it by doing this sort of magic thing on the first line of, that, of, of what I was calling a module. So something.py will now have this at the top of it. And you have to set your permissions correctly so it's actually an executable. So change mod, give everybody the ability to execute that. That's what that means for Unix people. Also works in Mac, I don't know how to do it in Windows. Script name.py, and then you just execute it. Yep? Yep. So if you double click, so if you've got a something.py and you've done, uh, you've done uh, this at the first line, you've done this at the bottom line, it actually has real functionality. If it's um, email my collaborators, and that's its job, it'll actually go off and email collaborators. If it basically um, makes a plot and you haven't actually you know, imported the right stuff, you'll probably get an error somewhere. Usually you don't think about double clicking on these things. You think about basically executing them either from the command line itself, just say that, or you might have a cron job which wakes up and calls that thing every hour or something, right? But, but you still need to have the type of it's not like uh, dot exe or file. Oh, right, so it's not, a, it's not yet a standalone. There are ways to make this thing part of a standalone, so you can hand it to somebody who doesn't know what Python is, and you just say double click that and it works. There are ways to do that to essentially bake in the things that you need from Python to be able to run this truly as a standalone executable. This is standalone in the sense that it doesn't need anything else except for the fact that Python better be in your environment. Okay, so here's a, a bit more of a, uh, a, a module that can also be executed from the command line if name equals equals uh, main, so this means everything inside of here was run from the command line. This is all the stuff that I had before, remember the get info? Right, that was just, uh, that was just a function that was exposed to me um, when I wind up importing this. And you see my special thing up here. Um, this is all the stuff that only gets executed if name is main, if I actually run it directly uh, from the command line or if I, um, uh, if I type run and the name of this from within IPython. So I'm gonna look at the, uh, something new here. This is a variable called sys.argv. Those that are familiar with C know about this. It's an argument vector that basically says um, what are the different arguments that were given at the command line. Um, if it's equal to one, um, basically if I only gave the name of it itself, then I'm gonna set the path equal to the current one and I'm gonna show the version of the, of the code. Otherwise, I'm going to look at um, uh, all the directories that were passed to it, and I'm basically gonna ask, is that actually a directory? If it is, then I'll get info for that directory. If not, I won't do anything. So let me run that, and now I just say dot slash modfun, the py, and I didn't give any arguments, so there's only one value of um, the sysargv, which is this whole thing right here, it, it'll, it'll appear as a string. And now I print out the version number and I look at all the things that are inside of that directory. If I give it a bunch of other directories, here this is the current directory, some temporary bad name directory, and some actual temp directory. I'll go through, print out the version, give me all the things that are inside of this, uh, um, uh, this directory. Note that my spamder is not a directory and then show me all the things inside the temporary. Okay, so this is maybe something you actually wanna do. You wanna have a cron job which wakes up, does this every hour, sends you an email with the results. Starting to get to some real functionality. If you make changes to a module, I met, mentioned this earlier, um, the, you know, if you actually change the code itself, and now I say S is equal to spam plus eggs, uh, and then I try to use S again, it, really doesn't know about it in my, in my current namespace. You have to do what's called reload. So you have to reload the module name, which forces it to go ahead 
and reload it um, and go as if it didn't know anything about that module. So import OS, OS.system, that's a new thing. That's basically making a call out to the system. Here I'm just printing out um, two different uh, files. Josh.py is import Josh2, x equals 1. Josh2.py, x equals 3. Or sorry, x, sorry y equals 2. Um, import Josh. OK, Josh1. So it'll, that will itself import Josh2. And now I can print Josh1.josh2.y, which will be 2. Now I'm going to edit Josh2 so that y is equal to true. If I reload Josh1.josh2, which is saying, go into the namespace of Josh1. Oh, and I've got this other thing, which is in its namespace called Josh2. Reload that thing. I'll get true. Reload, you're going to wind up using a lot. You're going to change some little thing inside of your module. You're going to save it. And then you're going to say reload. You're going to try to rerun something again. OK. So uh, any questions before the breakout? Yeah. OK. Did everyone hear that? If you're within not the IPython uh, interpreter, which you do that magic function to boost, but you do DIR and then probably uh, parentheses, there is a built-in that tells you all the new things that you've added to the namespace. Or it gives you everything in the namespace. Um, but we still don't know the way to do the new things in the namespace. We have to figure that out. Um, OK. Remember, help is your friend or the question mark inside of IPython. Yes? We're going to try to figure out a way to do it just within Python. <laughs> um, OK, here's your breakout session. Create and edit a new file called age.py. Within age.py, import something which I haven't told you at all about. It's called the date time module. You can guess what it does. It helps you with dates and times and stuff. Um, you're going to start learning how to learn about new things within Python. That's in some sense what this is about. Use the datetime.datetime function to create a variable representation of when you were born. I haven't told you how to do that. There are some arguments, maybe some keywords. You're going to have to figure that out. Use datetime.datetime.now to create a variable representing when now is. Subtract the two, forming a new variable, which will become a, a type of um, date time, time delta object, and print that variable. So here are some questions. How many days has, have you been alive and how many hours? And you use these two things to help you. Uh, what will be the date in 1,000 days from now? Create a new file called h1.py when run from the command line with one argument. Uh, h1.py should print out the date and days from now. If you run with three arguments, print the time and days since then. So here's some functionality here. Age1.py, give me 1,000 days from now, that's that, whatever that number is. If I give me, uh, if I have three arguments here, print out the, time, the number of days since then. See how far you can get with it. <laughs>